It is good to be a child of the King, is it not? Yeah. You know, one of these days, all of those who, are, who have their name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're going to hear the trumpet blow, the angels shout, and they're going to see the Lord in His full glory coming to take us home. Uh, to take us to our eternal home, ultimately, that he has prepared for us. Now, don't get me wrong. At that day, everyone is going to hear the trumpet blow. Everyone is going to hear the angel shout. And everyone is going to see Jesus. And every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And yet, some of them will be saying that facing the judgment. Some Some folks will say that ultimately con- condemned to an eternal fire, an eternal flame, an eternal place of torment. But for those who are children of the king, we know that, uh, that he is faithful, that he is trustworthy, that he never, never changes. And we know that, as his word tells us, that he has gone and prepared a place for us. And if he's gone and prepared a place for us, he's going to come again, return again, and receive us unto himself that where he is there we may be also. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. We're going to continue this week with the second part of the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ. And if you've not picked up on it, the last several weeks, we've, I've gone back and I've preached on certain doctrines that Baptists believe. Hopefully that Christians believe. This week, we're going to finish up the doctrine of Christ. It's important for us to understand and have the proper perspective of Jesus Christ. If we don't have the proper perspective of of Jesus Christ, then we don't have the proper perspective of salvation. If we don't have the proper perspective of salvation, then it is impossible for us to share effectively the testimony of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in other words, to share the gospel with someone who's lost. It's impossible for us to lead someone to Christ if we don't know how to get there ourselves. You understand what I'm saying? So my hope and my prayer is, is that when we continue, or conclude, when we conclude this study of Baptist doctrine, that you can effectively lead someone to Christ. And if you're here this morning, you don't know Christ, My hope and my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and draw you to Christ, that you too will look forward to His appearing. We're going to go back and read the same passages that we read last week out of Hebrews in chapter 1, not to say that there are not many more effective passages in the Bible that uh, that speak concerning the doctrine of Christ, But the writer of Hebrews, he he speaks all through the book of Hebrews and he gives us sound doctrine on which we can stand and we never have to back up from. We can can answer answer all the questions concerning who God is, who Christ is, how we relate to them and how we can be saved. So Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, hath in these last days, and folks, these are the last days, spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Let's bow our heads once again for a word of prayer. Our Father, Lord, we thank you for presenting yourself to us in the form of Jesus Christ, your perfect sinless Son. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice he made on our behalf on Calvary's cruel cross. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you give all men, women, boys and girls, to know you and to be saved. Lord, forgive us where we fail you and fall short of your glory. Help us to be more effective in our witness for you. 
that more people might be saved and go to heaven and fewer people die and go to hell. Lord, forgive me where I fail you personally. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, I want you to notice something, and I don't remember if I point, I don't think I pointed this out for you last week, but in verse 2, that's a very interesting verse. So if you'll go back and read verse 2 with me, it says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. I want you to keep in mind <clears throat> that from the point of Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, his appearing for 40 days, and his ascension into heaven, from that time until this time, we have been living in the last days. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, but we know that it's going to be very soon. For almost 2,000 years, prophets and priests have been declaring have been declaring the second coming of Jesus. And I want you to know that in my lifetime, my short 54, going on 55 years, that I am closer today to Jesus' coming than I was at the very moment that I was born. We look, at, we look across the congregation, and I want you to understand that you're one day closer today to seeing Jesus is appearing than you were yesterday. So when the, when the writer of Hebrews wrote, hath in these last days, he wanted every reader to understand, listen, you are living in the moment that could be the appearing of Jesus Christ. Do you know what? He may come back this very day, this very hour. He may delay another two or three days. He may delay a week. He may delay a month. He may delay a year. It may be 50 years, but I want you to know you are living in the last day. So how will you live? How are you going to live? I hope that you live with a proper perspective of who Jesus Christ is and what he did on your behalf. I hope that you can live in expectation of his coming, looking to him as Lord and Savior of your life, prepared to enter into eternity in the place that he's prepared. I hope that you are living as a living testimony. And you're witnessing verbally as to what the Word of God tells us. You know, I was talking to a pastor friend of mine just this last week. He pastors over in the central part of the state. And as I was talking to him, and <clears throat> we were talking about, I told him, I said, well, I've been preaching a series on church doctrine on what Baptists believe. And um, I said, you know, I'm convinced that the majority of church members, now this is not speaking to any particular individual, but he's speaking to the New Testament church as a whole, but the majority of church members don't have a proper perspective of Baptist doctrine in order that they might lead someone to Christ. My friend, if you cannot lead someone to Jesus, you need to go back and rehearse what Jesus did for you. And if you can't find at some point in your life of some some transition that took place, some, some drastic change that took place in your life, then you need to go back and you need to read the gospel for yourself. You need to understand the proper doctrine and perspective as to who Jesus is and what he did. One of the first things I want us to look at this morning is, as we look at Jesus, we've got to consider Jesus as fully God and fully man. Now what I mean by that is he's fully divine, and fully human. We know that John speaks of Christ in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. He speaks of Christ as the Word, beginning in John chapter 1, verse 1. And then if you jump on down to John in chapter 1, verse 14, it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Speaking of Jesus incarnate, being born of a virgin. We talked about that last week. Coming and living in the flesh. But at the same time, never once did Jesus leave behind his divine nature. As a matter of fact, when, when one of the disciples questioned Jesus and asked him to show, him, show us the Father, John, Jesus replied in John in chapter 14 and verse 9, he said, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. 
A little later on in John in chapter 10, in verse 30, Jesus makes this profound statement. I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. There are other, there are other texts that, that uh, show Jesus had a unique relationship to, to his heavenly Father. And still there are New Testament scriptures that indicate his wide range of power over nature, over demons, over scripture, and over the forgiveness of sins. But if we look at Jesus in his human nature, we know that Jesus identified with humanity in his baptism. And Jesus' humanity is clearly, it's clearly described in his wilderness tempting. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, for instance. If you want to turn over there, I'll read that scripture passage real quickly. It says this. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Now, I'm going to pop that verse up here for you in just a minute. Actually, I'm going to show you verse 14 just prior to that also. But these verses <coughs> assert that Jesus was tempted in every way, just as you and I are, yet he remained sinless. If you look at the temptations of Christ when he wandered in the wilderness. The first temptation Jesus was tempted with was to turn the stone into bread. Remember, Jesus had been wandering in the wilderness. He'd been led in the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And this is important to understand. That word led in the King James English is actually translated as driven. He was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted of Satan. So the first temptation, when he would, had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 days, was to fulfill the desires of the flesh, to fulfill that, that carnal hunger that he had. And so Satan said, take this stone and turn it into bread. The second temptation that he faced was when Satan took him up on the pinnacle of the temple. And showed him all of the land and all of the nations. And told him, said, I have the power to give this to you. The third temptation that Satan tempted him with was simply just to fall down and worship him. Just to fall down and worship him. Now, it, it's ironic that Hebrews speaks of Christ being tempted just as you and I are, and yet James in chapter 1 and verse 13 tells us that God cannot be tempted. Now, folks, let me tell you something. This is a part of the unique mystery of Christ being fully divine and fully human at the same time. But because... Jesus Christ was fully divine and was fully human and was tempted and yet sinless. He perfectly is able to represent us to a holy and righteous God. He's perfectly able and capable and worthy. I told you I was going to pop these two verses up for you. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 and 15. Let me read verse 14 for you. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed in the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Verse 15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Isn't that amazing? Do you realize that every morning that you get up, Satan begins to, he begins to get his devices together to lay the snares out so that he might cause you to stumble as he tempts you with the temptation of the flesh, the temptation of power and authority, and ultimately the temptation to fall down and worship him. That's been his goal since he was in heaven as an angel. He wanted to take God off of his, his throne, his kingdom. And he wanted to replace him with himself. Do you realize that Satan wants to be 
God. Unfortunately, in this world, the Bible tells us that he is the God of the world, the prince of the air. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you realize it or not, you are worshiping a God. If you don't know him as Lord and Savior, you have succumbed to the temptation to make Satan your God. Well, now, preacher, hold on just a minute. I don't, I don't practice Satan worship. I don't do Wiccan. I don't, you know, I don't bow down at, at a, a demon's image. I don't give in to, to all of these carnal desires. Let me tell you something, my friend. You were by nature born a sinner, separated from a holy God. And there is no in-between. You're either saved or you're a sinner. You're worshiping the King of kings and Lord of lords in heaven above. Or you have given in to the wiles of the devil. And that's what the Bible tells us. That he puts those wiles, he he lays those snares, he uses all the devices that he can to prevent you from making God your God. And to present you as his subject. So you're either saved or you're a sinner. You're either a child of the king or a child of Satan. The good news is this. Is that if you respond to the word of God, which reveals the son of God, then you can become a child of God. If you'll simply place your faith and your trust in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ, who came fully divine and fully human at the same time. You see, Jesus is God's substitute. Now, let me, I don't want to confuse you there. A substitute is often something that devises its appearance as something that it's actually not. It's much like, and Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites. You've heard me use this terminology. The word hypocrite comes from the Greek word, which literally means play actor. It means that you are putting on a show. Jesus did not nor could not put on a show because he was fully God. Jesus is not a fake substitute. Give you an example. Like a substitute sweetener. You know, there's just something about natural sugar. It tastes different, does it not? You remember years ago, they came out with all these substitute, they determined sugar was bad for you. And so they came out with all these substitute sweeteners. Now listen, I understand there are some people that have problems with their sugar. They're, many people are diabetic and therefore they cannot, they cannot intake any added sugar. And for that cause, when America started getting fat, pardon the expression, I resemble that remark. When America started having problems with diabetes... When America started having other health issues, they came out with artificial sweeteners and they say, listen, this is, they said, listen, this is the solution to all of our problems. They came out with things such as aspartame. They came out with th- other things that, that I can't even pronounce. And they began to add them to the food and the drinks that you and I t- intake on a daily basis. Sodas. One of the first things. Now, I don't know if you, really, if you really paid close attention. I remember when I was a kid and the first artificial sweetener came out in a soda pop. And I popped the top, or actually, I didn't do that. I went to the side of the, the counter and I popped the top on the, y'all know what I'm talking about, on that, pop, on that bottle, on that pop bottle. And I took me a big old swig of it. Y'all know me, I, I grew up with Coke and peanuts. I'd take a big old swig of Coke and, 
And then I'd take a package of salt, salted peanuts and I'd pour it down in there and suck the foam off the top. But when I took the first drink of an artificially sweetened soda pop, it turned my stomach, it left an aftertaste. It wasn't good. A little later on, they said, well, you know what? These artificial sweeteners are not the greatest thing for you. As a matter of fact, some of them can cause cancer. I could have told them that when I first took the first swig. It wasn't the greatest thing for you. And they've come out with other sweeteners that are a little bit safer now, but they still don't have the same effect. When Jesus Christ came, he came as God's substitute for humanity, not a substitute for him. He fully represented God, but he became substitute, the substitute for humanity. Let me tell you how he did that. First of all, through his priestly work. Through his priestly work. He became, if you go back and you look at the scriptures that, uh, that we read this morning, verse 4, more specifically, says, Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. We find in verse 3 that he's sitting, sat down, at the right hand of the majesty on high. If you back up just a few, few words before that. When he had by himself purged our sins. The priestly work amongst the Jews, it was a very common knowledge what the priest was responsible for. It was for offering up sacrifices. One thing that he did on one day a year, he would enter into the Holy of Holies. He would present the sacrifice, first of all, for his sins. Secondly, for the sins of the people. He'd lay that sacrifice upon the altar. And so the priest was responsible for atoning of the sins of man, or atoning for the sins of man, including his own sin. And by doing so, he served as a mediator between God and man. A mediator reconciles two separate parties. Where there's a disagreement, a mediator brings both parties together. Now, in God's case, there is no compromise, simply sacrifice. Where man, in his mediation, tends to compromise one side with the other so that they can make a common or come to a common conclusion and get along. God does not compromise. So the mediator on our behalf had to make us righteous in the eyes of God. And that's where Christ, being fully divine, fully human, being tempted as you and I are, yet remaining without sin, took our place. He took the place of a priest. So that when he purged us, or he purged our sin, no longer do we resemble our old self in God's eyes, but we appear before God as the righteousness of Christ. The old way, it could not be that way, because the priest, in, hum in his humanity, was sinful. The priest would have to offer for his sins, first of all, and then offer for the sins of the people. And this would have to happen again next year on the Day of Atonement, and again the next year on the Day of Atonement, and again on the next year of the Day of Atonement. But when Christ came as the perfect man, God, or God, man, he was able to present the last and final sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. That we might be not compromised, but reconciled into the righteousness of God. It was a new and better way for the, Jew to, for the Jews to come into the presence of God. That was a new idea. Because before this time, the Holy of Holies was separated 
from the rest of the tabernacle so that only the high priest could enter in to the presence of God. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that temple veil was rent. It was torn from top to bottom, making the way for you and I individually to enter into the presence of God through the blood of Christ. With Christ, the barrier which separates you and I from the holiness and righteousness of God is removed. Matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews writes more about that in Hebrews in chapter 10, in verses 19 through 20. And I realize the, there's a lot of verses up there and the words are kind of scrunched together. But Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22, rather, says this, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In times past, sinful man a, a, a sinful man representing sinful people would bring in the sacrificial lamb to lay on the altar of God in the presence of God. But the fact was, is the moment that he walked out of the Holy of Holies, the moment that he temp was tempted, the moment that he entered into the presence of the people, sin was present. It was still present. Never before had a perfect priest existed who could bring a perfect sin offering. But Jesus, the great high priest, the one who was without sin, who was perfect in every way, was able to accomplish that. He was able to accomplish that. He accomplished that due to his sacrifice on the cross. He accomplished that with his priestly ministry he accomplished that and when he did he made it possible for every man woman and child on earth to come directly in the presence into the presence of a holy righteous and just God you see Christ justified us For all those who responded in, who have responded in faith, you are justified in the eyes of God because of what Christ did. What did Christ do? Well, that brings me to the third point this morning. I'm glad you asked. You see, Jesus became God's substitute for sinful humanity. But he also serves as man's redemption, man's redemption or redeemer. To plainly put it this way, if you remember, Jesus told the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus was cast into hell. They both died. La uh, Lazarus, excuse me, the rich man was cast into hell. Lazarus was ascended into heaven and, and he was resting in Abraham's bosom. Abraham described a, a great chasm, a great rift, a great distance, a deep valley that was impossible for Lazarus to cross. Abraham represented that to the rich man who was in hell in torment. A place in which Lazarus couldn't cross, nor could the rich man from the other side. You see, before we're saved, there's a great chasm between you and God. There's a great distance, a vast expanse, that it's impossible for you to cross over to God. But let me tell you what Jesus, what Jesus did as far as our redemption. 
He paid the price and Jesus became the bridge that spanned the vast expanse, the chasm that prevented you from entering into the presence of God Almighty. Jesus became the bridge over whom we can come into the presence of God himself and have perfect forgiveness, perfect cleansing, and perfect salvation. Again, the writer of Hebrews writes in Hebrews in chapter 7 of the priesthood of Melchizedek. Let me tell you something. Melchizedek was a priest and a king in the time of Abraham before the order of Levitical priesthood was established. And yet, Abraham came and paid the tithe to Melchizedek. We have no record, no genealogical record of when Melchizedek was born or of whom he came. We also have no death record of Melchizedek ever dying. The Bible, the Bible describes Christ as after the order of Melchizedek. Now think about this. We have no record of Melchizedek ever being born. We have no record of Melchizedek ever dying. Think about this. Jesus was born. Jesus died. Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus lives forevermore. As believers, we wait for the perfect Savior to take us to the perfect heaven that he has prepared for us. Friend, I ask you this morning, Jesus said in John in chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life and no man cometh to the Father but by me. Do you know him? Do you know him? In the words of a famous uh, black preacher who's died and gone on to be with the Lord, that's my king. Do you know him? Christian friend, if you're here this morning, you've, you've gotten away from the proper perspective of what Jesus Christ did on your behalf. Let me encourage you to get in the Word of God. Read it for yourself. You get it settled before the Lord. And you share it with everyone with whom you come into contact with. Brother Don and I are surrendered to full-time ministry, but it's not our job. Am I right, Don? Your wife agreed with me. We're not hired guns to go out and take care of all of the dirty work of the church. Now, I'm not saying that it's not partly our responsibility. But I, what I am saying is it's partly our responsibility. The rest of our responsibility comes at equipping the saints to go out and do the work of the ministry. If you're a saint this morning, say amen. My hope and my prayer is, is that as you've heard the doctrine of Christ, that you are properly equipped to go out and share him with someone who's lost. And if not, I have a question for you this morning. Do you know him? Do you know him? Let's stand this morning. As our music team comes, will you respond accordingly as the Holy Spirit has prompted you this morning? If you'd like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've heard, what I've, you've heard the scripture that I've quoted. Would you make that response public this morning? Maybe you didn't quite understand 
everything I was talking about. Will you allow me to share more with you this morning about what it means to be a Christian and know that you can have eternal life through Jesus Christ? Christian friend, one simple statement. Do what you've been called to do. Serve the Lord. And that does not mean handing out candy or popcorn or soda pop or even bottles of water in the name of Jesus. Though those are good things, that's not the main thing. <coughs> the main thing is telling people how to be saved. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for this day. And Lord, I thank you for your word, for your son. And Lord, we know that you, you promised that your word will not return void. And Lord, let it be your word this morning. We pray your spirit would speak and people would respond accordingly to your invitation upon their heart. Lord, forgive me where I fail you. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen.